I find that oftentimes when people talk about neoliberalism, they keep the discussion at such an abstract level that it's difficult for people to understand um, how the topic impacts their daily lives or what the ultimate meaning of the discussion is. And of course, the definition of neoliberalism is, is a, something that's disputed and has changed over time. And so what I want to do is first talk about neoliberalism um, at the level of definition and the elements of uh, economics and politics involved in it. And then I want to use agriculture as an example because it uh, impacts all of us, either as producers or more likely as consumers, because um, we all need to eat. Uh, so first of all, neoliberalism and economics. Uh, neoliberal economics emphasizes the primacy of the marketplace um, and the power of the market, but it has become a market managed and helped by government. So in the neoliberal uh, era, there is a um, an alliance, you might say, between the market and the government that uh, allows the market to be managed somewhat by the government and also for the government to be impacted by the power of uh, businesses and corporations uh, that need its help. Um, so in government policy, there tends to be a favoring of corporate economics over small business um, in, in various ways. And we'll talk about that when we get to the example. Government policy encourages uh, global trade and interdependence through all sorts of means. Uh, both domestic and foreign, uh, but in particular uh, through trade deals that bring down barriers to trade so that corporations can, um, can operate freely around the world. In neoliberal economics, economic growth is always the goal, uh, even if many in, in any country, whether it's the United States or elsewhere, uh, are sacrificed for that goal of economic growth. The idea is that economic growth is a good enough good <laughs> for enough people that it's worth the disruptions and sacrifices uh, that some have to pay in order for countries to achieve that, that constant growth. Another aspect of neoliberal economics is that there has come to be an acceptance of family, neighborhood, and town being disrupted uh, and sacrificed to the primacy of the market, meaning that um, it, it's more imperative that people move and change their way of life to fit the economic imperatives of the moment than it is to keep their family in one place intact uh, to develop neighborly ties over the many years it takes to do that uh, or to establish and maintain community relations in a town. People are always moving, in other words, and people are always making decisions on the basis of the economic imperative. When we extend the idea of neoliberalism to the market, we see that the market mentality uh, becomes embedded in the political process. So constituents, political constituents, uh, see that become themselves consumers of market products and government services. They see themselves in that way and government more and more treats them that way as consumers. So government takes an interest in them as consumers that keep the economy going and also as consumers of its own services. Because the neoliberal economy emphasizes corporate power and big government is a part of that, responsibility is fractured among many parties. Uh, so it's hard to tell, in other words, who's responsible, especially if the um, problem is with the corporation, because of course corporations are owned by many millions of stockholders. Uh, of course, we have government uh, leaders, politicians, bureaucrats trying to regulate, manage, enable, benefit uh, various economic partners. So 
responsibility is fractured and it's hard to find uh, who is ultimately to be uh, you know, called upon to fix a problem. And yet at the same time, each individual is held responsible for his own fate. And we'll get back to that one when we get to ideology. Because everything has become rather big and responsibility is fractured, there's been a decline in the efficacy of direct and indirect political action. People sense that political action, whether it's voting or protesting or whatever, doesn't really have much of an impact because in most cases it doesn't. Um, and that's because the machinery on both the uh, the corporate side as well as the government side uh, runs kind of uh, more and more on its own um, and with what we might call technical rationality uh, rather than being responsive to even the politicians, let alone the, uh, the political constituents. So instead of taking direct and indirect political action, people are told that they can vote with their pocketbook and that the way to support their country is by uh, consuming, the way to support certain policies is by choosing to consume this and to not consume that and so on. Well, those are just some aspects of neoliberalism. Now let's take a look at neoliberalism and agriculture. We can see the government corporate nexus or relationship all over the place in agriculture. Of course, um, the government is heavily involved in, in supporting, regulating, uh, shaping, uh, you know, farm policy uh, and farm outcomes. Uh, there are farm subsidies uh, for the production of commodities, and there are commodity and foreign aid programs to help absorb the excess uh, commodities that are produced. So farmers might be encouraged to grow a lot of corn, a lot of feed corn that can be um, shipped all over the world, that can be used for many different products, um, and the government may subsidize that operation, may guarantee a price, etc. Government's foreign economic policy favors large-scale commodity producers um, because it, it has for a long time attempted to lower trade barriers and keep them lower and to encourage uh, the trade of these food commodities. Uh, all over the world. Corn, wheat, soybeans, pork, beef, chicken. Government subsidization, taxation policies, trade policies, all favor large-scale producers. And so do government regulations. Uh, large farms uh, can afford to deal with regulations that apply to their operations, whereas smaller farms, and especially diversified farms, where they're not just growing one crop or, or raising one kind of animal, uh, find it very difficult to adhere to government regulations that are going to cost them a lot more uh, to uphold and maintain um, than these large corporate farms. Finally, in that government corporate nexus, you can see a heavy corporate influence on scientific research and development at universities, which of course are somewhat subsidized by the government. The corporate influence comes from the money that corp corporations involved in agriculture hand out to um, agriculture programs. Uh, for university professors and scientific research teams to do research that helps with their particular um, their particular needs. So let's think a little bit more about agricultural research in neoliberalism. Uh, one of the aspects of neoliberalism that has to do more with a mentality. Uh, that comes from the market mentality is that technical problems usually elicit technical solutions. In other words, the notion is we do create problems for ourselves with our technology. Um, for instance, you know, when we use pesticides uh, on a crop, 
maybe it produces you know too too much uh, runoff it goes into our streams or it kills a particular kind of uh, frog or whatever uh, then in order to address that problem uh, we uh, we come up with another technical solution. The response is never to stop doing that, but to find a way around it. Because there's a, there's a deep faith in the ability of science and technology to solve all problems. So market and scientific solutions are presented as rather sacred and dogmatic, um, especially in the area of, of agricultural research where the emphasis is on science and yet it is, as I pointed out, sometimes, in fact, often um, subsidized by industry. So this research takes on a kind of sacred character that isn't to be questioned and any opposition to agribusiness or large-scale farming um, is framed by those engaged as an assault on the market and or on science. So like all things, it seems to take on the, uh, the aspect of us versus them, strangely enough. Small farming is framed as a specialty niche that supports a minority lifestyle at best and is somehow subversive at worst because it doesn't follow um, current scientific standards, doesn't recognize the uh, globalized marketplace as the place to, uh, to achieve success. Finally, in neoliberal agricultural research, there tends to be a, an obscuring or a lack of accounting for the costs that are incurred by people and by the environment. Those are not calculated into studies, um, but those costs are, are incurred by everybody. Um, they're incurred by the taxes that people pay to support the subsidies and the regulations and all the scientific uh, findings that aren't paid for by private and corporate business incurred by the people in health problems ranging from obesity to cancer uh, all the environmental problems that are cleaned up sometimes in fact often if at all with our tax dollars so the costs are spread out and paid for by people generally um, if they're paid for and fixed at all. Some of the ironies that come out of the neoliberal food system are, uh, first of all, that consumers and producers uh, are expected to sacrifice in the name of economic growth, even if it means such strange oddities as so-called food deserts in rural areas. Now, you, you're probably not surprised that there are food deserts in urban areas. Uh, right in the middle of, of the city. Um, it's hard to find even a, in some places, even like a quick shop. Uh, but, but also, strangely and ironically, there are food deserts in the Midwest, in, in the heart, the so-called breadbasket of America, with all this farmland. Uh, there's, in many of these small towns now, not a grocery store, not a local farmer that actually grows food that can be sold to people and they and they are often relegated to uh, shopping at Dollar Generals which have prolifer proliferated all over the Midwest um, or some stores like them or eating at Dairy Queen. There aren't any local farmers who are diversified and could sell you a chicken, some eggs, maybe some vegetables, maybe some apples, some milk, some cheese because that's not deemed efficient and that's not deemed as um, as rational uh, in the face of the globalized economic system. We're supposed to specialize. Along with that is the irony that families, communities, and lifeways continue to break up to make way for growth and that means that an awful lot of uh, rural areas are are experiencing uh, very low population, people leaving small towns, some towns becoming ghost towns basically, um, people who are left behind becoming hooked on alcohol, drugs, you know we have the opioid crisis going on because there's no there's no real prospect for them. Um, 
Another irony of the system is that all these costs are incurred by people generally, such as the pollution and you know, the dislocation, which creates a need for government welfare programs and so on. Um, but at the same time, consumers are made responsible um, as though they, uh, through their voting with their pocketbook and their behavior, uh, can change the problems as big as food waste, pollution, and global warming. If we just had enough self-control and stopped buying all these things in plastic and running around in our cars, we could save the planet. So the idea there, I suppose, is that we need not look to either government or business to change uh, anything. We can do it ourselves. Of course, that's convenient, uh, but as we know, it doesn't work. Another great irony is that locally grown foods become somehow luxuries for the rich. We've moved from a few generations ago, poor people were very likely to grow some of their own food and knew how to do it. And it was considered a sort of a sign that you weren't, you hadn't made it, you know, especially in city. I came from a fairly large city and um, my my family had a rather large garden in the backyard. There were people who definitely thought that that we must be really poor, or we or we wouldn't do that. So, like a lot of people, though, did that. Um, and now we're at a point where, because the uh, neoliberal system does not support local, diversified family farms. They have become kind of a niche market. They have become something that is associated with foodies and liberal elites and, uh, you know, upper middle class and, and wealthy people. And that is a great irony to me. Another related irony is that more and more poor people get, get fat because they are eating cheap dollar general type food that is highly processed that comes from all that che the, all those cheap commodities that go into making that kind of food uh, but it's not good for people's health um, whereas and the rest of us eat quite a bit of this stuff too but those who want to stay thin well if they can afford it they go and pay someplace to allow them to go and exercise so in other words, we have very few people doing manual labor anymore and actually getting their exercise coming up with their own food or helping to grow it or uh, raise it. Um, so we spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars, uh, you know, trying to, trying to get that kind of work done in the gym. And finally, neoliberalism is supported by an ideology. And it's an ideology that grows out of an earlier phase of classical liberal uh, thought and economics. Um, it, it comes from a place in which people believe in the free market. And so it has become a sort of, as I would call it, ignoble lie that emphasizes liberty uh, while constraining people's choices in the ways that I've described. To make this concrete, we're told that we can be entrepreneurs, but it's very, very difficult for a person to decide to become a small farmer. When they, when they start out, they have to try to get a loan, for instance, if they don't come from a family who already owns a farm, or that farm is all in commodity crops and isn't going to be changed. Uh, it's difficult to get a loan. It's difficult to get the knowledge to do it. It's difficult to get the labor help to do it. It's difficult to pay the taxes and to come up with the ability to uh, pass inspection to deal with the government's uh, regulations. So it's not so easy to be an entrepreneur these days, especially in certain areas. And also on the consumer side, uh, our choices are, are fairly constrained. Uh, we're, we're certainly encouraged to shop um, at the supermarket and buy processed foods, but life becomes quite a bit harder if you try to eat healthy and if you try to support your local business people. 
Another aspect of neoliberal ideology is that it is often tied to Christianity, uh, which has the effect of making it a moral imperative to support the breaking up of family, community, and small enterprise. If that sounds ironic, that's, that's just it. It is ironic. Um, somehow God gets tied up with the market and with this idea of economic freedom, even though there's not that much economic freedom, or at least not as much as, as people imagine there is, but Christianity gets tied up with that, that ideal, to support a system that in all actuality has been the death knell of small town communities and has broken up and consumed the lives of many, many families. Another irony is that economic resourcefulness in individuals and groups becomes treated like subversive and misguided behavior. And what I mean by economic resourcefulness is any sort of behavior that involves people figuring out how to not spend money and take care of themselves fairly well. So if people decide that they're going to grow their own food to a certain extent, um, or they're going to even more like work with other people, uh, let's say in a neighborhood or in a group, in order to uh, share resources. Uh, this is treated like it's an odd thing. However, it's a very old thing. Again, going back just a few generations, it was quite common for people to do this. People of my parents' generation. Um, did not buy things unless they actually needed them. There was no consumerism uh, even a few generations ago. Frugality and thrift were considered virtues and um, neighbors often helped each other. And I should have said, and families likewise. Um, extended families tended to be closer together and so they were there to lend a helping hand. But now any kind of uh, sort of self-support and support of others, while it does give people more independence, is treated like the opposite, as a sort of threat to freedom or as some sort of ideological assault, and with good reason, because the people who do that are just not spending money, and without spending money we can't have perpetual economic growth, and that becomes a problem. That is, if enough people did it. So the ultimate irony is that a lack of resourcefulness is seen as superior, as ambitious and sophisticated, to be a specialist, in other words, in one small thing, whether it's growing soybeans or it's, you know, fixing iPhones or organizing somebody's closet, that is considered to be a more sophisticated and ambitious undertaking because it fits in with the uh, with the economic system as it is. To me the greatest irony of all this is that neoliberal agriculture has produced a situation where no country in the world that's engaged in the globalized um, markets is truly independent and does not have food security. And if you don't have food security, you don't have much security. People forget that without a steady access to food, life becomes very hard very fast. And we're so awash in it um, here in the United States that it's easy to forget that. It's not very rational to discourage people from developing agriculture in their local communities and to try to feed themselves in their local communities as much as possible from what's right there in the area. It makes a whole lot of sense from the point of view of freedom and independence to encourage local production of food in particular since it's so immediately needed and disruption in the food supply can cause so many problems very quickly. So anyway, I hope this has helped um, bring neoliberalism down to earth a bit and into an area that should be of concern to everybody. All right, bye.